Lyndon Johnson prepared his entire career to fight the war against America's social ills. He said he was determined to be the greatest president of them all. And he might have been, except for his other war, Vietnam. When it came to the war in Vietnam, Johnson anguished over the stark choices. If I left the woman I loved, the great society, in order to get involved with that war on the other side of the world, then I would lose everything at home. But if I let the communists take over South Vietnam, then I would be seen as a coward, my nation as an appeaser, and we would both find it impossible to accomplish anything, anywhere, on the entire globe. In March 1965, President Johnson sent 5,000 Marines to Vietnam. Three years later, that number had reached 500,000. At first, the president was able to balance military and domestic spending, but as the cost of both guns and butter escalated, it was not sustainable. The American military machine had pounded away at the enemy for more than three years. In 1968, Johnson insisted the enemy was nearly defeated. But in the early morning hours of January 30th, 1968, the enemy launched a massive attack that proved they were stronger than ever. U.S. forces and their South Vietnamese allies repelled the attack. The Tet Offensive, as it came to be known, was not a victory for the enemy in military terms. But the battle turned the tide of public opinion in the United States and called into question much of what Americans had been told about the war. After Tet, it was clear that there would be no victory for the United States in Vietnam. Even some of Johnson's closest advisors began to lobby for a withdrawal. The president lamented, everybody is recommending surrender. In the end, it was Johnson who surrendered. I shall not see, and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. There was a sense of finality to his statement but Johnson's remaining months in office were some of the most tumultuous in American history. But I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. In April 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in Memphis, sparking riots in major U.S. cities. Let's go on to Chicago and let's win there. Just two months later, Democratic presidential hopeful Senator Robert Kennedy was gunned down in Los Angeles. The unrest climaxed when anti-war demonstrators clashed with police and National Guardsmen during the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Johnson reflected back on the year, saying, I sometimes felt like I was living in a continuous nightmare. Johnson's great society benefited millions of Americans, but critics complained that it dramatically increased the size of the federal government and budget deficits. The president hoped to unite the country with social programs, but his administration left the country more divided than at any time since the Civil War. Despite all that he had accomplished, divisiveness and war became his presidential legacy. As for the man, Hubert Humphrey described him best. He was an all-American president. He was really the history of this country, with all of the turmoil, the bombast, the sentiments, the passions. It was all there, all in one man. In the decades following Presidents Kennedy and Johnson, the trend in the White House turned conservative. In the course of 40 years, only 12 of them have been governed by Democratic presidents. Still, the grand visions and policies of these two liberal leaders continue to inspire and shape modern America.